next episode of Talk with Mike and Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? Well, we're here we are with Talk with Mike and Tom, 1214 First Avenue, Uptown Columbus, in the Rothschild Building, third floor, high above the First Avenue, with episode nine. I think that's about okay. right, my friend. This is time to go by fast. It doesn't take us long to get to nine. We're about to go into double digits. So we're talking uh, episode nine, colon, psychopaths. Well, I guess so. Uh, today, I guess I'm, I'm reading a book, and I, I couldn't help but bring you into this. And um, it's, it's really an interesting idea because uh, I'm, you know, always interested in psychology, always interested in what makes yeah. people tick and yeah. uh, trying to figure things out. I, and, and we all are to a certain extent, um, which, which uh, it just on an earlier podcast, we talked about true crime podcast and uh, maybe coming soon to a ColumbusPodcasting.com episode here uh, in CMG studio. So keep in mind that uh, true crime may be coming up, but that's sort of a variation on the psychopath of the and the people without conscience and the people who commit crimes or just have some rather difficult, unpleasant personalities to deal with. What would the true crime episodes be uh, sort of samples of personality aberrations? I mean, in oh, the yeah. book you're reading, that's right. incidentally Without Conscience is the name of the book. That, right? is, that is true. It's by um, uh, Robert Hare, and uh, of course he's a professor emeritus in the psychology department in the Canadian University. Does that what does it, that's professor emeritus? That means old retired professor, and that's I, something I, we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I think a lot so. of us around. You yeah. may you may yeah. be familiar with the term as yeah, uh, you right. are one of those. I am people. one. That's right. Uh, yeah. There's some kind of special permission. Maybe you get like a discount on coffee. I don't know for sure. So, that's what what do you get when you get one of those? A nice letter. That's what you get. It's okay. a nice letter. I have framed it, and uh, I'm off to the races. So getting back to the true crime and personality disorder idea, yeah. uh, one of the things that this book talks about is the whole idea that crime, at least for the psychopath, crime is uh, sort of a career pathway, right? Because you're perfectly suited for crime. Right? Well, you are, <laughs> because as the title indicates, uh, you have no conscience. You, there's no empathy. There's no real caring about others. There's just nothing that blocks you from uh, c uh, committing a crime, and you don't feel any remorse or regret about it. Now, that is really out there, if you ask me. I, I just think, for the most part, most of us have a very different lifestyle, and I don't know the statistics on the amount of yeah. uh, sociopaths right. in, in our. Uh, I look, we can look that up, and but the but the idea being that uh, we need to understand these people because they're out to take advantage of us in so many well, ways. Well, it seems like at one time, the the idea uh, the term psychopath meant someone who had some kind of psychotic break. You know, you had the psychopath movie where right. where they the splatter flick, and then you had the idea of the sociopath, which now the term yeah. psychopath sounds like it's referring to those 12 sort of qualities of that we used to say were sociopathic, right? So right. is there a difference? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I think the sociopath has always meant a little more severe uh, with the crime to, that connects with it. The sociopath then is the person who is really antisocial, oh, okay. and that's where we're at now uh, in the diagnostic in the diagnostic manual. Um, so there are things that just run against the grain in terms of our society, not getting along in our, and fitting in in society and not really wanting to, or not having the skills or not having the exposure. And then later on we may talk about nature versus nurture in this right. uh, conversation, but the idea that this, uh, this is not available to them and they don't have this conscious, they get away with things. And I think there's almost a... Uh, it may be a continuum from the sociopath into the psychopath where it's doing something just, just horrific, and I think that may be a distinction. So is every psychopath the career criminal who's robbing banks and uh, uh, setting cars on fire? The, like the, the characters in The Joker, some of those guys seem like they were psychopathic, you know, creating 
a yes. civic disorder, all that kind of thing. Well, I think also you're going to put a, a more severe um, uh, category in there too with the people who are serial killers and kill other people okay. for no reason and right. taking advantage of. And that puts you in the psychopath kind of thing. Just so, something that we normally cannot fathom in our own thinking and day-to-day lives. How could someone possibly do something like that? And I think that's where the psychopath kind of comes in. There's an interesting list of uh, the... Um, the uh, uh, key symptoms in that, and I, and I jotted those down. So let me just give you a quick. We'll kind of come back to these, but on the, both an emotional, um, interpersonal side, and also uh, with the social deviance. So here's what we've got on the emotional, interpersonal. We've got a glib and superficial personality, egocentric and grandiose. Uh, the lack of remorse or guilt, which I'm really interested in. You either have that or you don't, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm curious about that. But what goes also with that is the lack of empathy. And then there are two more, deceitful and manipulative yeah. and shallow emotions. So that's on the, uh, on the emotional sort of interpersonal side, and you begin to see that in this person. And uh, if you're not ready and prepared for that, you can sort of be sucked into that void and be manipulated and find yourself in some real trouble uh, if you're not paying attention. So I, getting back to my, my thought about crime and true crime and all that, all that stuff, is it, is it possible that psychopaths exist across the board throughout society and don't necessarily manifest in criminal behavior or illegal behavior, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, I, I really think that's true. You probably have the uh, uh, a subunit of that, and I think he talks about it in the book. And there may be even sort of uh, the sociopath, the white-collar crime uh, group or the white-collar really? group that, that sort of gets away with things, you know, just yeah. just out of the view of law enforcement. Um, so there is really a continuum, as it, as, it, as it seems, so that there's some people who, you know, test the limits, go a little bit further, take advantage of people, and I think he talks about the, those as a subgroup um, that, that really still there's a lack of empathy uh, there's a lack of, uh, of building a good relationship uh, that that will kind of that most of us do in our lifetimes. Uh, by the way, let's talk a little bit about that lack of empathy. So, w- what what does a healthy, adjusted person look like in terms of empathy, and what might that look like? And then, uh, what might this psychopathic lack of empathy look like? Well, you know, one of the first things I think it seems to be this lack of remorse or guilt. Most of us have, when we do something wrong, we feel guilty about it. Some of us more than others. Some of us quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Maybe we beat ourselves up a little too much on some something that we, we don't like about what we've done. Um, and I think most, the majority of people fall into that category where we have an active uh, psychological system that um, causes us, us to feel guilty, feel guilt, feel remorse, sh- feel shame, feel shame, mm-hmm. and it, it's yeah. a part of a normal emotional um, uh, system that we work from. And I think this lack of empathy, uh, the inability to see it from another's point of view, uh, and I, and if if you don't have that, then right away there's going to be a problem with you uh, managing your own um, your, your own behavior and kind of judging things and making sure that hey I didn't go too far I didn't hurt the other person I didn't hurt their feelings or I didn't do these things that would cause a problem and we have some some uh, 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 guard against that if mm-hmm. you will that the that another person never never quite uh, sees so so if you don't have empathy then you also don't have that idea of guilt or shame if you say hurt someone, injure them in some way. Yeah, and, yeah, and I and I also think that um, what what happens is that um, that the, the, these people that we're talking that he's talking to Dr. Ha- uh, Harris talking about in his book it really have this inability to construct a facsimile of another person and how they might think and feel and react, um, that that's not, they just can't do that. They can't see it from your point of view. 
So how, what is that person's Even when you try, view? you can't do that. Most, right? of, most of us see the world as made up of people like us in a lot of ways. And so we think, uh, you know, when we're dealing with someone, let's say someone's uh, working with us in a customer service kind of format, we, we see them as like us, right? Right, we, we do. And the tendency is that um, we, we have both a physical and a psychological understanding of another person in some ways, and that there's a degree of sensitivity to another person uh, so that w- we can understand the feelings and the plight of others. And we, we, we tend to take that into account when we take action ourselves and, and begin a behavior. I heard someone once talking about a uh, a spouse, actually, and what she said was, you know, he's got just this piece missing. It's a chip. It's not in there. It's just he he can't see from my point of view where I'm coming from. He doesn't get it. Right. I mean, it's not that he intends ill. So I'm not saying that that individual was maybe this this kind of uh, um, psycho path or you know had this right. kind of pathology but right. but at the same time uh maybe it's not programmed or is it part of uh is it genetic what do you think well that he goes into it a little bit in the book and i tend to agree with him when he comes down to uh not necessarily the environmental factors uh more of the uh nature or the genetic the oh, really? passed down the yeah. biology um that uh genetic biology that's kind of helping un- us understand this um that's that's his take on it and I, I have a tendency to sort of believe that this is not something for the most part that you can fix easily uh, he talks about therapy in the book and how that doesn't quite work, uh, and there's some issues with that. Uh, but I, but I think that most of us um, may even have some thoughts that that align with uh, with these people who don't have empathy and and uh, connection with others and sensitivity to others. And sometimes we, in, in a normal range of behavior, uh, can can kind of delve into that just a little bit. And you see that in some white-collar crime and other kinds of things that where people take advantage of. They don't pay their taxes the way they should. They take advantage financially in the big financial corporations, and they you know get away with things. And, yeah. and there's no punishment because there's no crime that's been discovered. Right. <clears throat> Versus some of us who, um, who really kind of fear of the fear of doing that is, Maybe there are a lot of reasons, but one may be fear or punishment. Yeah. So guess what? I think that's what we're saying. I remember Omo used to say, guess what? When I, in, in, in that phrase for me is that guess what? Uh, these psychopaths and these guys who have all of these, the non-empathy that we've just talked about have no fear of punishment. And the blaming is only always on the other person, or it's outside of them, which I find really, really interesting. So, some of these behaviors, like the the idea of being impulsive and having poor behavior control and a need for excitement, sounds like other pathologies. Like there are pathologies like borderline personality, and uh, uh, the uh, it it just I wonder if there's some connection between this specific pathology and those personality disorders too, like say, uh, borderline personality disorder. Well, the um, the DSM uh, five now in the in the edition uh, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, for the American Psychiatric Association, and basically, this is a classification system for mental disorders. So, right. when you get into the uh, personality disorders, there are a big array of those, and there are some the symptoms are kind of overlapping. Overlapping, I've heard yeah. people actually talk about that that idea, but. Um, for each of those personality disorders, there's a list of symptoms, and you have to have so many of those out of the categories that they, they list in order to f- get that diagnosis or, or be moving toward that diagnosis. And so what I think happens is that you'll have a lot of other different mental disorders that may uh, show or manifest uh, themselves within a person that are not necessarily aimed at getting over 
uh, on another person, oh, okay. the lack of empathy. So on that's that. the that's the key. Yeah, the the sort of antisocial part of it, and of course there is the antisocial personality yeah. disorder that sort of encapsulate all of these that we we've been talking about. So there's a personality order called antisocial. Yes. Okay. And then there's there's the uh, new take on what used to be called manic depressive. Who had the, those? Yeah, the bipolar. The yeah. bipolar that has some of these personality. I guess indicators like the uh, behavior control, the need for excitement, impulse, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you you will see some overlap in this, and I think what what you're describing are, you know, these symptoms. And you mentioned borderline and mm-hmm. and, and personality disorder and uh, and the bipolar personality disorder. And these, so these are mood swings. These are sort of affected by mood. They're also f- sort of focused on the individual turmoil that a person is oh, okay. dealing with, but also the interpersonal. So it could be in relationships. And, we, uh, you know, talking about borderline uh, personality disorders, these are very chaotic personality styles. And they're looking for the excitement. They're looking for the impulse. They don't kind of see things long term. Uh, they may have so much internal chaos, mm-hmm. they're typically trying to push and manage that by pushing it out, oftentimes toward another person. And so if you've ever, ever felt crazy around another person, but you're not really sure why, uh, <laughs> might be something that They're punching about. my buttons, man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, I, I find it fascinating. We, we maybe just come back and talk about these personality disorders and some of the traits and other uh, of all of them, but the the uh, book Without Conscious by Robert Hare really has has uh, taken on a uh, an interest of mine. As I, I've kind of looked at it, he's he's done as much work in this particular area as anyone, and I think the the idea of now that we know that these are the symptoms, and I listened to those um, just a few minutes ago, but I didn't add the social deviance part of it, which I think we've touched on, but. You just mentioned the impulsivity, uh, poor behavior controls, the need for excitement, the lack of responsibility, the early behavior problems. So you see this early on in a person's development. And also then the adult antisocial behavior, and that's the criminal, the people who are breaking the the law and so forth like that. So those are sort of this social deviance piece to it as well. So... With those, you can see that if you have any one of those or a combination of yeah. those, you're likely to be in trouble or find yourself into some serious trouble. Well, one of the things you said that intrigued me was the lack of efficacy in terms of of uh, therapy. Right. Because those other personality disorders we've discussed, they they t- tend to be treatable with with therapy and also with medication. So right. this is not tre- treatable with medication. Well, no, I'm not a I'm not a doctor, so I can't uh, talk about what what that uh, that part of it is. But for sure, uh, talk therapy in its uh, more normal form yeah. is not going to uh, make a big difference with these folks because it does take a certain amount of self insight, the ability to sort of look at your own behavior and make some choices. And, and so forth, but the uh, this, the the psychopath, uh, the person without the empathy and the, the guilt, are not going to see any problem with themselves. Mm-hmm. They're going to see this as uh, other people's or societies or other uh, by other means. Um, so talk therapy really about insight, at least many of the theories that that are at practice in uh, in counseling centers around have to do with you kind of looking at your own behavior oh, okay. and making some judgments about yourself not so much worrying about and by the way this may be a surprise for some people but not worrying about the other person that you think's causing all the problems in your life but you're actually looking at yourself and with with that uh that's sort of the hard part of therapy sometimes so the talk therapy is really looking at yourself, but uh, th- these folks don't have that ability to really have the insight. And so sometimes people talk about a behavioral system where reward and punishment, for example, might be able to have an effect on these people uh, in, in terms of realistic expectations and consequences. So you're saying the very thing that w- enables folks to to work with a therapist in treating themselves this this kind of 
issue this kind of situation that piece isn't there to no, to I, engage I, in therapy I, and i also think that if you're not well trained in this you could be manipulated uh, manipulated as a therapist the oh, therapist really? may be manipulated within that system oh, by, really? the per, by the person because often you you'll see these folks who 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 pull this off they they uh they may be um uh, interesting. They may be charming. They have a lot of charisma. They they uh, can use words and they can try distractions and uh, you know uh, sort of their presentation sometimes is a bit exciting and overwhelming and you sort of gravitate toward that. He talks about it in the book that, that we need to have our radar out for yeah. those kind of things. If we think it's too good to be true, this person is the most wonderful person we've ever known or just come across, then maybe we need to put the brakes on and really start thinking about this because these guys are masters at that. Think about it for a second. If you have no guardrails for and your goal is to be successful, you're, you're going to push everybody out of your way to get there. And you're going to manipulate and try to maneuver people uh, to get your ends met. And you may be a victim of this if you're not careful. So law enforcement, uh, social workers, they see this a lot, don't they? Yeah, I, I really think so. And and uh, I, I think we're, we need to educate ourselves. I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to re- read more into this, uh, this area. But I think across the board... Um, we need to be more educated about it because I really don't want to be manipulated by somebody or my pocket picked, uh, so to speak, uh, and to get in a situation where I really don't want to be. I'd like to make good choices about that. And I think we've got to be uh, aware that some of these folks have those really antisocial, lack of empathy, lack of caring, but they make a they put on a presentation that sort of draws you into the relationship and you may turn out to be the victim so if you're saying a therapist could be manipulated what hope does the <laughs> layperson have for not yeah. being manipulated by someone who's so skilled in deceit and manipulation and and also doesn't have the social checks that most people have well that that's a, that's a great question and and at toward the end of the book uh dr Hare talks about this this idea of really first of all knowing yourself and and we talk about this a lot in different ways but but uh know what you're dealing with mm-hmm. um and i don't i don't think he's saying we need to be paranoid about everybody we meet in this in this environment but you, you really need to take time to learn some of this information so you can have it at your disposal and um, and really sort of be aware of the drama that's in front of you at times. Uh, mm-hmm. That's kind of exciting, but it may have some manipulative pieces to it. And we've got to we've got to kind of visualize what's going in front of us. Now, one of the things he said I found interesting was he said, listen, when you're engaged with this person, close your eyes. Don't take on and look at all of the sort of fanfare that's going on in front of you, but just listen to what the person is saying. Mm-hmm. Listen to the words. And and if uh, that that's a first beginning. And so um, go into each relationship with your eyes wide open. That's another thing that he says because if right. you, you've been there, yeah, you may have a tendency to get there again. So yeah. I found that very interesting. It's like I know from the, some um, marital work and, and counseling that I've done that people tend to remarry sometimes uh, uh, to get out of a problem and find themselves back into the same problem. So you, r- books written about that. But we you had talk talked about that. about that too, the whole idea that certain personality types attract certain other personality types. Types. Yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, that that that's really another fascinating side of this. That some of these, well, if you take the narcissistic personality disorder, we've mm-hmm. talked a little bit about some of the symptoms. Yeah. Uh, even today, without right. mentioning the term, but those people need to be adored by others. They yep. need to be the center of attention. Yep. Everything they do is right. Everything's about them. Well, if you pair that with, say, uh, a personality or trending toward or having a personality disorder where they're needy 
and they need uh, someone to sort of help them, and uh, they're looking for someone to save them and help them in their world, there's a narcissist. And so what you find sometimes uh, is the idea of the narcissistic personality attracting the borderline personality disorder. Okay. So that's always a Well, that would be a dramatic, dramatic marriage, wouldn't it? Yes, there's a lot of fireworks uh, with that. I mean, I do not want to be into any one of those, but I could watch it on TV uh, yeah. at any point in time. So, so w- what are the, what's the tip-off? I mean, you, you said uh, listen to what they say. What What's the tip-off, uh, and where might you find this happening? Could it be anywhere, or do people exist along a continuum that – some folks are sort of have some of these elements, but not all of them. How does all that work? Well, I, th- those, that's, a, that's a big question, and yes to most of those questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a continuum, and pe- you will see people. Probably not as much as you think, but there, there is some. And, and I tend to say that there's these trends toward some of this bad stuff yeah. necessarily, that the person may not be full-blown diagnosed. Uh, uh, with a diagnosis of this, but they may act in their lives with some of these particular symptoms that we've outlined. Right. So you could be sort of uh, have lack of responsibility, need excitement, have poor behavior control, but not necessarily have the whole thing not be missing the empathy piece. Or, yes, I think those, those, are, those are good ones. And I also think the idea that uh, it's never your fault, it's always someone else. And <laughs> right. if you listen to that conversation, if you right. can, close, like he said, close your eyes and listen to that conversation for just a minute, you see, wait, this guy's taking no responsibility. That's yeah. not quite right. And so you really, you, you really need to know yourself. I think know also if you're that person who likes flattery. For example, mm-hmm. somebody says, "Hey, that's a good-looking haircut today, man. Mm-hmm. I like that shirt, and everything's you know." You when you start to hear that, that's a that's not well. That's pretty nice. We all need some right. of that occasionally. But is this uh, is this a possibility that in that circumstance you're <laughs> yeah. being taken advantage of? And it's something about you that you like to hear that the the manipulative person, the sociopath, the antisocial person uh, that we're talking about, person with lack of conscience, may take advantage of you in that right. in that regard. Yeah, that whole flattery thing. That is that's when you need to start holding on to your wallet, right? When you yeah, when you I, find your uh hey, you know, I've never met anybody quite like you. You're great. You know, well, that kind of I thing. have I have for years I remember talking in class and teaching this idea that uh you know, and I and I made the comparison of the uh the sitting down next to someone on an airline and all of a sudden they tell you their whole life story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when when a person moves too fast in building a relationship, <laughs> That's a key for me. And then yeah. I, I've tried to talk to uh, tr- in training therapists about this very notion that, that w- wait a minute, a normal getting to know someone doesn't happen so fast and it, it, it builds over time. You, uh, you, you're not on a first-name basis uh, two minutes after you, you've met. Uh, y- y- the flattery piece of it, somebody's trying to kind of sell you something a little bit. Those are all kinds of things to be on the guard on the guard for because uh yeah it goes too fast more than no- what's normally expected mm-hmm. and i think being more aware and kind of examining yourself don't blame yourself if this happens to you that's the other some of his advice in the book uh recognize that you're not alone uh, be careful about these power struggles sometimes that drama uh that you're engaged in you didn't start it but you may come out feeling like the victim or feeling like you've done something wrong yourself when you haven't. So cut your losses, get some support, talk to a professional, of course. Uh, but on and on it goes with this mystery of these psychopaths because it's still in our environment. And you, when you said continuum, I really think that we're seeing the, a continuum of this. And it's not like okay, these are psychopaths and they're way over here mm-hmm. out of our lives. No, there's some much closer to us and those who are using those type of symptoms closer in our world than we may know. Would you say certain environments create a a situation, a Petri dish, where uh, this can thrive? In other words, if someone has these tendencies, they're in a certain environment, it may not 
manifest, but in a different environment, it might. Yes, I, I think so. I think in uh, I th- it sounds, and I don't know this for a fact, but here, here's sort of my thinking of it: that that the sociopath is going to move to uh, an environment where they're not getting f- feedback or constant feedback and information about their behavior. Okay. Because most of us do. I mean, mm-hmm. I've kind of joked about it and said, well, if you're if you're married then uh, you got an automatic feedback system there for yourself. And uh, so, and that's good for all of us, I think, in some ways. But, 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 but yeah, so a Petri dish of, of, uh, of places to be where these sociopaths may, may take hold. And again, I'm, not, I'm kind of concentrating on the, the without conscience, the lack of guilt, the lack of remorse, and the lack of the ability to see it from another person's point of view. Those are major issues um, that indicate we've got a problem. Um, And because most of us in our day-to-day activities and our families, our lives, our friends, and what we do and work and so forth, take into consideration the other person and what does it mean and how does this going to work out for everyone, not just myself, but how is it going to work out in a general sense for people? Well, we, we live in a society. It's a global society. So let me throw out some sayings that we hear a lot okay. or, or similar things. All right, go. Uh, here's, here's one. Look out for number one. Yes. Gre- greed is good. Uh, do what feels right. Uh, don't fear. Don't give in to fear. Well, all those things sort of sound like it creates an environment where this kind of behavior might thrive. In other words, if I don't fear, I don't, uh, I'm always about number one. I'm never about you. I'm always about me. I do what feels good to me at, at, without any, any holds on my behavior, then yeah. isn't that promoting? As a, see, I think in terms of society, a lot of times narcissism is promoted. In other words, yes, uh, yes, you know, sure. the, the selfie culture, for instance. You know, I, I right. wonder about that. I mean, I, I, I'm not ripping on selfies necessarily. No, no, not necessarily. But if that's the end game, what, what your Facebook is going to have tonight, if that's right. your whole thrust of your day, <laughs> then it's a little, that's a little bit too much me, me, me yeah. for, for yours truly anyway. Well, I'll tell you, most people, thank you for being that way. Uh, otherwise, this will be a short podcast. <laughs> um, but, but really, I think what, what you're saying there is, is, is true and that it's in our society sometimes to, to be a little more narcissistic, to be able to reach our goals in this sort of you know, subtly in our, in our uh, dialectic. But I, for me, I, I think we have to have that ability to empathize and care about other people, and that makes us part of the, the social animal that we are. Um, it's interesting too. We were talking. You, you were talking just a moment ago about the, uh, the, the you know, the capacity that people have and I think there was something he wrote about uh, in a book and I think in the book and it was just a, a little out insert there when he says two businessmen are walking together each carrying a briefcase and one turns to the other and says uh, we are morally bankrupt we are only morally bankrupt and the other guy says thank God so um, uh, you have to read it. I'm not sure I presented that joke as well as it went as a time I read it in the book. But the idea is that, uh, yeah, you can get away with some things and get over on people, and, right. and it's not the it, nothing's going to be made of it too much in in certain circumstances. And it may be the environment that you're in that uh, you want that person to kind of take charge and move forward and push people out of the way a little bit to get to the top of the mountain and look out for number one. But uh, living in a society, that's a little harder to do, and uh, uh, th- that lack of shame and guilt and remorse uh, is a concern when people are doing those kind of things, I believe. Well, the old old saying is, character is what you do when people are not looking. Yes, and, uh, I love it. That's so a great So anyway, the, the book is right. Without Conscience by Robert D. Hare. 
Okay, sir, you uh, can hold it up and, uh, to uh, that camera right there. We'll uh, we'll get a shot of it. Yeah, there we go. And so we have uh, talked All about right. Daniel Pinker. We've talked about Robert D. Hare, and we've talked about the Joker, and that's just the last three weeks, and wow. Uh, there's uh, more there's to come, a, evidently. Uh, yeah. that, and I don't know what's going to happen on this true crime podcast that you're about to start, but I'm interested in see where you're taking that one. <laughs> I don't know so. if that's uh, that's in my wheelhouse, but uh, <laughs> anyway uh, – yeah, we've we've seen a couple of good movies this weekend. We've seen uh, the the Lighthouse. That was oh a good my one. Goodness. And I hope uh, Doctor Doctor Rose he's going to do the Lighthouse. First of all, he's responsible for getting us to that movie. It's his fault, and it's his fault. That's, That's how right. I see it. That's and right. he needs to come in and explain himself a little bit uh, in that movie too, because that was two hours. I'll never get back. Well, to quote Mike Baltimore, uh, I walked out of that movie, and uh, my reaction was, what happened? So uh, that was one. And then the other is Motherless Brooklyn. That's a good movie, too. So there's some good ones out. And I think our uh, next project is the – Reboot of the Terminator, the Terminator part. I feel like I've already seen yeah. that movie with all the previews, but That's right. uh, it may not be the case. So we might give that a shot. Yeah. Well, Tom, it's been uh, yeah. it's been great being on the podcast again today, talking about Dr. Harris' book, the uh, the idea of without a conscious. Let's hope that everybody's got a conscious out there, and we take care of each other and take care of ourselves and make things happen without all of this other ugliness that's going on. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Well, listen, uh, CMG uh, Columbus Media Group, uh, we're at 1214 First Avenue, Uptown Columbus in the Rothschild Building, and we bring you Talk with Mike and Tom and Got Therapy and uh, uh, Sean Cruzen and his meanderings on astrophysics. So uh, a lot of things going on, and uh, uh, again, great to be here with you, Mike. All right. Thank you, Tom. See you next time. So long, everybody.